Thanks so much, Leela, and thanks, Samu. It's an honor to be on this call with you all. I've loved everything that you've been putting out to the world so far, and um, good to see some other friends on here glow, and looks like Tess is on the way onto the call. And yeah, a little bit of background about me. I um, am a permaculture designer and teacher, and I'm a musician, and a lot of my music has messages for humanity and for a vision of a thriving, vibrant world. And um, back in 2015, with my previous partner, Anahata, we put together an organize organization and also my previous bandmate, Sophia and friend, uh, we put together an organization called Blooming Biodiversity. And we were inspired by the Polish Ambassadors Permaculture Action Tour. We were inspired by permaculture in general and just wanted to get a bunch of people together and go around doing permaculture events, getting people together into their local communities and um, activating the land and also bringing in things like music and yoga and workshops and essentially taking what draws people to a music festival and bringing it onto a farm or an eco village so that we could get that excited creative energy and put it into land-based projects. And so we did a three month tour down the West Coast. I have a sideshow that I'll show about it soon. Um, but just for the context, we did a tour with about 30 people, went to over 60 eco villages and permaculture centers down the West Coast from Canada all the way to Southern California. And then essentially just continued doing that for the rest of our lives. <laughs> we still do events like that every once in a while. Um, most recently being when I was in Guatemala last winter, I helped organize a permaculture event and a mushroom event actually at the Funga Academy. So we called that a mycelium action day. And we've done a couple of mycelium action days that are focused on mushrooms and mushroom regeneration. And then with my music, I also, um, just put out a song called Global Village Tapestry, and it has scenes of me playing the song at eco villages all around the world in Costa Rica, in Guatemala, in Japan, and um, just a bunch of people dancing and singing about this vision of building a global village tapestry. So the, the idea, the way I like to think of it is like a mycelium web around the world of all these positive regenerative centers that are helping the planet and the people and um, also I'm helping to organize a permaculture design course, which actually is starting today. This is the first day of this 18 day permaculture design course taught by Sarah Wu and Ryan Rising. And I've been helping to organize that since I think last November, maybe even earlier. And that's just an 18 day deep dive and everyone's gonna get certified in permaculture design and learn all the foundations, so. Yeah, that's a bit about me. And I also want to share that I've been fundraising for permaculture projects in Africa, in both Kenya and Uganda. And um, I've been working with some permaculture organizations over there that have been um, helping to grow food and get water systems. And it's all people that are there, that live there, that are from there, that are doing the work and that I'm fundraising for. So they're actually leading the projects and I'm just helping guide funds towards them. And as a result, they've been able to grow a ton of food for all the farmers and get water systems set up. Whereas before they had to walk really long distances with buckets on pretty dangerous roads. Um, and then especially once COVID hit it made everything more difficult. So the fundraising to get them to be self-sustaining has been crucial. And then um, in Uganda, I fundraised for this guy named David to go to school. And then he told me that they're not really eating a very nutritious diet. So I suggested he could talk to his principal about starting a garden. And he talked to his principal. The uh, principal was stoked and gave him a bunch of land at the school to start growing permaculture gardens for all the students. So yeah, sometimes it just comes down to saying an idea to the right person and then it makes something like that happen. Yeah, here it is the intersection of permaculture music and earth activism. So 
I used to think that I just had too many interests to be able to narrow it down into explaining what I do, but then I realized that I can, it basically all falls into these categories of permaculture, music and earth activism and event organization, which um, the event organization I do is both permaculture and music related. Um, currently I'm helping to organize an online music production retreat where everyone's gonna learn how to make their own electronic music and acoustic music and DJing. And um, I always like bringing that intersection together of land-based regenerative practices and music and earth activism, because then it's like, we're making music with the message and then we're doing the things that we're singing about or that we're trying to promote through our music um, and putting it into action. So that was essentially the foundation of the permaculture tour blooming biodiversity was bringing together this intersection of permaculture music and earth activism. So um, last February, last year in February, I put on a retreat called Solar Sound. It was an electronic music production retreat. And this is my friend Sutu Khan, who's Mayan, he's Sutu Hill Mayan, and he was talking to us about how he brings music into activism um, in Guatemala and also around the world. And he has a song for the bees. That's what he was presenting in this and a song for a bunch of different um, animals. And it's all in his Mayan language. So he's actually teaching a lot of the kids that have lost contact with their native Mayan language. He's teaching them about their language and their culture and cosmology through music and through song. So it's um, indigenous, um, indigenous people teaching indigenous people about their culture and keeping that alive. And he's also doing a lot of amazing things for the land. And actually, um, Sutsu told me that Bill Mollison, who's the founder of Permaculture, went to Guatemala and spent a lot of time with the Mayans to develop some of his concepts of permaculture. Um, and that's actually true for most indigenous cultures because Bill Mollison and David Holmgram, the founders of this concept of permaculture, this design system. They went all around the world studying indigenous cultures and studying natural ecosystems and learning from different farmers. And um, they put that all into consideration when coming up with this comprehensive idea of permaculture. And for those of you who don't know what permaculture is, um, the most simple way to explain it is permaculture stands for permanent culture and permanent agriculture or um, because nothing's permanent, I also like to think of it as perennial, which um, perennial is like something that just keeps regenerating over time. You can think of it like a perennial plant would be like a tree where every year it's gonna bear fruit, whereas an annual would be like lettuce that um, you harvest it and that's it and you plant the seeds again. So um, permaculture is just a design system that's based on nature and based on studying cultures around the world that um, keeps the land healthy, keeps the people happy <laughs> and is regenerative. So um, when I was in Guatemala, I put on this permaculture action, this permaculture event that I mentioned. So this was at a farm called Granja Tzikin, which is in the town of Tsununa. Um, we actually had a dance party at the ecstatic dance place across the street called the Daya Dance Temple where the embodiment festival happens. They just had a festival. So we had a dance party in the morning with the DJ, a bunch of people came to dance. And then we said, all right, we're going across the street to do permaculture. And so a bunch of people didn't even know what they were getting themselves into. They were like, I thought I just came to dance today. And then next thing they knew <laughs> they were in the garden and doing cob natural building. And it's just amazing to be able to channel that energy because everyone loves to dance, but not everyone knows that they love to do permaculture until they do it. And once you get people in the garden, they're having the best time of their lives and they're also learning a lot and they're helping the land. So um, yeah, this is Neil on the right, who is one of the founders of Granja Tzikin. And there's some goats. And um, there's some of the local Mayan kids in Sununa, who Joshua, who started the Gaia Dance Temple, he's been teaching them how to DJ. So they actually were the first DJs of this event. They were DJing in the morning as everyone was arriving. So that's also a really cool thing too, is this integration of local community, working together with the locals, inviting them in, 
Um, all, of, all of the events that happen here at the Gaia Dance Temple is free for all the locals. So there's always a lot of local Mayan kids dancing around at all the events and even DJing. Um, all the kids <laughs> love to dance around in circles here um, and jump on people's backs. So it's super fun, that local integration. Uh, here's some mushrooms growing, um, some spores. So the cool thing about this location where the Gaia Dance Temple is, is across the street is the permaculture farm and just down the hill is the Fungi Academy. So I also did a similar event um, a Mycelium Action Day at the Fungi Academy. And this one was focused on actually teaching how to grow mushrooms to the local Mayans, which it was their request. They asked um, the Fungi Academy and said, they wanna learn how to grow their own mushrooms so they can cultivate it and sell it um, and also eat it. And so anyone of course was invited to come and learn, but the main focus was teaching the locals um, per their request. So this is a Mayan woman learning how to inoculate a log to grow mushrooms. And yeah, it was just a super fun day and a bunch of people showed up to it. And again, we had a dance party in the morning to get people there. And we also had a dance party afterwards. <laughs> so um, this is the organization that I co-founded, Blooming Biodiversity. Um, we kind of go off of this concept of this Mark Henson painting of on the left is the destruction um, and the city burning down on the right is like this eco village paradise. And as a humanity, we're kind of at this crossroads where we decide which way to go. And as you can see in this painting, there's a bunch of people going from the left up to this place with all these hieroglyphics um, of what's possible, and then going to the right to this vision of a thriving world. And um, yeah, we used art like this. We, we actually met Mark Henson and asked him for permission and he supported everything we were doing. So we used art like this for our tour, went from BC through Oregon, Washington, California. Afterwards, we went to Hawaii, to Peru, we went to a bunch of places. Um, so yeah, we had a bunch of art, a bunch of things to get people excited about what we were doing, lots of posters, um, and we did a bunch of events. So. This is an example of what it looked like when we got, um, this was just our core team. We also did events where we just invited everyone in the local area. Um, Cause the idea was we were bringing together local communities in every place we went rather than having like one big name artist we were touring with um, as the draw, we used the talent and people that were in each local community we went to, to be the draw. So this was our core team. We had more people here and there. It was a three month tour. So different people were there at different times. Um, you can see bird hiding in the kale over there. Um, and we did this tour in the fall. So there was so much abundance of food that we essentially like fed ourselves from these events the whole time because we went and helped out on the farm, did a bunch of work. And then at each place we went to gave us a ton of food because there was so much abundance. Um, at this time of year. This is us in Canada on the Winged Heart Farm on Salt, um, on, yeah, Salt Spring Island. Really amazing, beautiful place. We're harvesting Tulsi holy basil here to make tinctures out of. We also harvested apples that day to make apple cider. Um, there's us at an urban farm in San Francisco or some people that came to join the event. Um, this is on, in Vancouver. This is just someone's yard in the city. So some urban permaculture stuff. And we had a dance party as we were planting things. Um, you might not be able to tell from the picture, but this is actually a twerk shop that then made its way out into the garden after we had planted some things. So we were giving the garden some blessings with their dance moves. Um, yeah, this is in Costa Rica. We were just, yeah, we were just having a great time planting things um, everywhere we went and people were stoked to have a big crew of people come through and help out. We did concerts. This is at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo at the experimental student permaculture farm. Um, so we got to lead actions and then share our music. Um, this is in Costa Rica. 
This is at the Lost Valley Eco Village in Eugene, Oregon, a really amazing space because it's an it's an official education center and they have all these dormitories and they can fit hundreds of people there. Um, and so it's perfect for putting on events and campouts. And so this was at the entrance to the eco village with this cob bench. And you, you'll notice a lot of this if you if you're not familiar with natural building, you'll notice a lot of these farms and sites that we went to have this natural building materials, which is just essentially, there's different ways to do it, but it's essentially earth and straw and clay and water. And you can build all these amazing structures just from what you can find in the ground. Um, yeah, we did human dollars like this. Um, a lot of things to just bring our energy together and bring our community together. <laughs> And um, this was actually in Costa Rica near Envision. This was a action day pre-Envision where we painted a mural at a local school and did some permaculture projects at local schools with the local Costa Rican kids. So that was fun. So we did a lot of just like whatever needed to be done. Each site we went to, we would ask like, what would you need help with if you had a bunch of people come and help out on, on your land? and there would always be something different to work on. So we got a pretty comprehensive experience. And um, for people that were new to permaculture on the tour, it was very educational. And we got to help out with a lot of things. Intergenerational connection, <laughs> working with the kids. We did some permaculture events actually that were at schools and with all kids. Um, we went down to Peru and worked with kids in Peru at a local school. Um, this picture is actually from the Polish Ambassadors Permaculture Action Tour. This was the year before the Blooming Biodiversity Tour. So we joined the Permaculture Action Tour to get inspiration and kind of see how they were doing it so that we could do our own tour the next year. And this was actually marching through the streets of Portland. Someone had a big sound system and we were marching from one urban farm to another urban farm doing action days um, at permaculture actions at each place that we went to. So this was fun. Um, you can see Aileen Mario and David um, there in the crowd with us. This was fun just bringing the energy literally through the city and people would see like this huge mob with shovels and pitchforks and instruments. Um, yeah, so tons of fun. We would serenade people um, during the breaks and as people were gardening playing music everywhere, really integrating music and permaculture was the goal um, and festivities. Um, here's some pictures from one of the co-founders of Blooming Biodiversity, Anahata. She went to India um, and worked um, doing permaculture things at Araville, planting a bunch of trees. So yeah, this really is like an international movement um yeah so many pictures in here of just really good things and yeah this is at the envision festival so we would do a lot of permaculture events right after or right before a festival so we could get the momentum of people that were going to a festival and get them to a permaculture farm this is a picture from punta mona which is an amazing tropical permaculture place and some of the perks of going to a place like this is you get to ride a horse in the ocean, which is something that a lot of people dream about doing. <laughs> so um, you could be in the garden one moment and in the ocean the next moment. This is a water blessing ceremony that we did with Sophie Moon and Esteban Yepes in the city of, Co of San Jose, Costa Rica at this amazing spot. Um, yeah, so it's really integral and holistic what we do. It's not just land based regenerative projects, but that's a huge core of it. Um, this was actually a permaculture course. Someone made this art of our class. Um, this is probably one of the biggest permaculture design courses ever. Um, this was with Starhawk, who's my permaculture, original permaculture teacher up in Canada. Um, and this was at the course. So um, for those of you who don't know how the whole permaculture education model goes, um, essentially they there's these permaculture design courses where um, it's usually two or three weeks and people learn all the foundations and basics of how to be a permaculture designer. And then you keep 
doing that kind of work and eventually you can start taking on clients and going to their land, assessing their land and seeing what kind of things can be added to the land to make it more regenerative. And yeah, we also brought this energy all the way up to Alaska, did an event called Aqua Ascension, which was a memorial for our friend Mario who had passed and this is where he grew up. We brought different indigenous elders with us and connected with the local indigenous elders. Um, I love this quote from Nelson Mandela, poverty is not an accident like slavery and apartheid. It is a man made, it is man made and can be removed by the actions of human beings. And I always think about how um, that the fact that there's enough resources for all beings on the planet is just about how it's being distributed and accessed. And if we truly were to switch to regenerative ways of living and growing food and relating with our food and with each other, there would be enough for everyone. Um, and if you look at the numbers, it's like actually mathematically and scientifically and statistically true, like the numbers of where resources are being hoarded and going is just so, yes, yeah, it's so ridiculous um, that we aren't able to meet everyone's needs um, yet, but that could change. So this is the permaculture design course that um, is starting today actually. Um, and we're gonna be doing this every year. So if you're seeing this and inspired and wanna sign up for next year, send me a message, let me know. Um, Sarah Wu and Ryan Rising are both amazing. And it's an 18 day permaculture course that has a people care extension, meaning there's gonna be extra classes from Sarah on herbalism and extra classes from Ryan on social permaculture because you can learn as much as you want about how to grow food but if you don't know how to get along with the people you're growing the food with or living with, then everything falls apart. And there's a lot of examples of communities that have lasted a long time and their best practices and communities that just fall apart because everyone has big ideas and visions. And at first it always seems like, oh yeah, we're doing this thing together, but then soon you start getting triggered by the other people and things start falling apart unless you have a good model for dealing with conflict as it comes up, which is inevitable. You, um, avoiding conflict is not the way to deal, to deal with conflict because <laughs> eventually it's going to show up in one way or another. So you need to learn and study and train and um, have a model for how you're going to deal with um, things that come up between people because it's inevitable. And um, my permaculture teacher, Starhawk, actually always says the main number one thing that keeps communities together is when they sing together, the music really brings a group coherence and gets everyone on this vibration of being in unity and harmony together. And then the number one thing that breaks communities apart is when people don't do their dishes and when there's <laughs> not, yeah, and when there isn't that responsibility being take, taken. And it's not just dishes, but that's like a good central example of like the type of thing that can break up a community. Um, so it all comes down to just everyone being responsible, having communication. That's why a lot of like heart shares and check-ins and councils are important, um, but you also wanna balance it because if you're having like five councils and check-ins a day, then people don't have the, enough of their own free time. So there's just a lot of things that I've learned personally from going to all these permaculture sites and eco villages and living for certain periods of time at different ones. Um, and I've really picked up like what are the best pra practices at each place? What's this community not doing that I saw work well at this other community? Or what is this community doing that I think would benefit this community? So that's definitely one of the benefits of going to so many places because I can see what works and what doesn't work. Um, and that's all I have for you on the slideshow. Um, so yeah, for anyone that's been watching and listening, if you're inspired, of course, message me if you want to do this permaculture design course next year. We are full. I mean, unless you want to just jump in right now and you're like, I'm going to drive there today. We do have a couple last minute spots that did open up, but it's pretty last minute to change your life plans for the next 18 days because um, you would have to get there today if you wanted to go. I mean, if you got there tomorrow, I'm sure that's fine too. And if you want to support um, the permaculture projects I have going on in Africa, also message me about that. 
Um, we're actively always raising funds um, and anything helps. A little goes a long way. And if you want to see my music video, um, search up, uh, search Bluminous, that's my music name, and search Global Village Tapestry, and that will lead you to the music video. And if you like the song, you can support me as an artist by getting the song on Bandcamp. Um, but it's also on all the other platforms. So yeah, thanks so much, everyone. And I'm happy to answer any questions or just go into a discussion or conversation, whatever feels best. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. I think it's really, really interesting and amazing to have this broad perspective and um, experience by traveling to so many places all over the world. and and seeing those regenerative communities with your own eyes and experiencing them in action. And uh, a question that came to my mind then is, based on your travels and everything that you've seen over the past few months and years, what do you think is somehow a pattern that needs to be in place as a structure, as a um, communication way of interacting, not just in a social way, but also with local governments so that, um, not just villages and communities and permaculture farms can become open spaces that interact in a very regenerative way, but also city, cities and urban, um, yeah, much larger regions that are right now going through a lot of um, disconnection from the earth and from community and from people. So what do you mm. think are the essential points or the essential patterns that need to be in place to catalyze this urban regeneration in cities? Mm, that's a really good question. Well, I, I think there's some really good examples I've seen of, um, of what the best ideal situation is for this. Um, but my, my answer is really to localize as much as possible. I think it's ridiculous how much food is every day being exported and shipped so far when it's like, you could grow your lettuce right in your front yard or you could go to your local farmer that's growing lettuce. Um, that's why like farmers markets are great because it's like not everyone can grow all that food for themselves, but they can at least support the local farmers rather than just getting everything shipped from really far away all the time. Um, but also when there's community gardens in place and just the more local food and medicines, the better. and the more systems in place for supporting that, the better. Um, in Nevada City, I know the person that started the Stone House, which is a music venue. Um, they also have a little eco village they're starting. And I met with them one time and had lunch and they were saying that they wanna start um, at, their, at their music venue, start having like all these local medicines and herbs that local farmers are making that they can showcase and sell there. and. Um, they already have all of their food at their restaurant is from local farmers, but they want to do even more of that of have having their venue as a place where local produce from local farmers can be sold. And um, I know the co-op there in Nevada City, Briar Patch, they do like as much local food as possible. So the more grocery stores and venues and places that can and restaurants can access like their local farmers, the better. And um, in terms of governments, what can be done is like one of the hugest issues for permaculture farmers and eco villages is zoning laws. And a lot of them are so out of date that it's like if someone was to just go and try to change the zoning laws, it would be very possible because it's like, oh, why do we even have these laws? Oh, it's because someone made it up a long time ago and it's not relevant anymore. So. Um, I've seen in Canada at the place where I did my permaculture design course, they wanted to build an eco village. Everyone told them that their mayor was like grouchy and he would say no, but they invited him to the eco village and he like um, saw a cob oven and started crying and said, I had one of these in my backyard when I was a little kid. And like he walked around and was so inspired that he made a whole new zoning law for them to be able to have eco villages. And now everyone in their county can build an eco village. And so there's all sorts of success stories like that, that I've heard and seen that are like, you, you never know, you just have to do it and you might just change everything. <laughs> I see Samu's hand is raised. Yes. Thanks so much for such an amazing 
walk through bloom i mean it's like it's really nice to have a, a pitch presentation of stuff that you want to do in the future it's even cooler what you just shared in some ways you know which is all the stuff that's already been done the community activations you know these these different dots on the, the gaia protection map mm -hmm. um that will go live later this year like all every single spot you visited is going to be relevant to like you know this as you say global village tapestry mm -hmm. um and then i uh I love how integral the music is to it too, because it's like, obviously you're doing what you love, which is connecting with the earth and playing music. It's like, you're just following your passion. You're doing what lights you up, you know, but it mm -hmm. also brings to mind for me um, something that I read years ago. And, it, and it's something that I've, I've worked with my whole like life as an activist and, you know, it's, um, an environmental scientist, which is like, the revolution is a party or it's not a revolution at all. Mm, you know, totally. finally turn over to a new leaf and, and build a more just, more sustainable, regenerative um, and inclusive society. It's like, it's got to be more fun than the one we're leaving behind. <laughs> totally. So, um, my question is like, how do you see your next steps of integrating those pathways like your your work as an artist and your work as a permaculture educator and you know activator mm -hmm. yeah that's a good question i mean i'd say one of the things that this pandemic has done is it's really catalyzed a lot of people to start um putting the things they've been talking about for such a long time into action so because of that i know so many people that are wanting to start eco villages or have already bought the land and they're starting projects here in Colorado, down in Costa Rica, like all over, it's starting to happen. So that means there's also even more of a demand for permaculture designers. So what I could see myself continuing to do is, well, of course, continuing to help organize these permaculture design courses and also organizing events on people's land. Um, one of the best ways to get something um, built really fast is to turn it into a course. So if people want to come and learn how to construct a yurt or make a natural building house, you can put a like three or five day course on and people are actually paying to learn, which helps cover the cost of the materials. And then that at the end, you have a new structure on your land or a new like permaculture system. And so, yeah. And then also, of course, bringing in the music, making it fun. Um, and I've also started working with a place called Tiny Temples that builds tiny homes. So um, yeah, continuing to do things like that. And they're also connected to a larger vision of wanting to do a land-based project on a larger scale. So um, yeah, I think the time is really ripe right now for doing more events and actions like this, getting people excited about permaculture and actually getting people's hands on the ground and um, teaching people the skills and getting things built. <laughs>